Excellent. We are recording the meeting such that we could then put the presentation portion on the website. It's important then that others who aren't able to join us this evening could hear that presentation and then be able to provide their input as well. So welcome. I see there are more joining us. I see the number of the tab is coming up, which is great. So um, we are very keen to, to have a good meeting this evening. So my name is Sue Cumming, Cumming and Company, and I'm an independent facilitator and I've been working on the Lakeshore Transportation Studies with HDR and the city. And I also have worked for many years on the Transportation Master Plan Plan, make sure connecting communities. So it's my pleasure this evening to be your facilitator. And if we go to the next slide, please, I'm going to read the land acknowledgement for us. So we acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty lands and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Wendat First Nation. We recognize the ancestors of these peoples as the inhabitants of these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. You can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to again welcome you for the this evening. We have um, attending tonight uh, Councillor Stephen Dasco from Ward 1. Um, and uh, we're grateful for that, his involvement, of course. And we also have Councillor Pat Mullen from uh, Ward 2, who was also attending. And uh, we'll be hearing both, we'll be listening to your input and uh, being able to, uh, to reflect on the project. Um, we have presenters this evening. We have Gino De La Cruz from the City of Mississauga. He is the project manager for all three projects. And I, I believe many of you have taken the opportunity already to reach out to him directly, so we appreciate that. We also have three key individuals from the consulting from HDR. HDR is the firm that the city has hired to do the studies and they carry on from work they had done at the Lakeshore Connecting Communities Master Plan. So we have Andrew Shea, who is a project manager for the BLRT or the, the BRT project component, the rapid transit. We have Angie Ning, who is a project manager for the complete streets along the Lakeshore. And then we have Nico Malfera, who's the project manager for the proposed new active transportation bridge across the Credit River. So they will be each giving you a small component of the presentation and will be available to respond to your questions questions and comments if we keep going. So the purpose of tonight is, is we hope very straightforward. It's to share information with you on the Lakeshore Transportation Studies and by doing so to provide an overview of the latest project information for three infrastructure projects. So many of you, I, I actually can see some familiar names, which is great from our first meeting, um, but certainly we hope you've had the opportunity to get a sense of what the study is about. So with the three infrastructure projects, there is a part A, which is the Lakeshore Bus Rapid Transit Study. There's a part B, which is a Lakeshore Complete Street Study, and then a part C, which is a new Credit River Active Transportation Bridge. And for this evening's purposes, we will be talking about all three projects, and we hope to seek feedback from you and respond to, to questions. We can keep going. So the format for the meeting is there will be a live presentation given by the presenters, followed by an opportunity for questions and answers. And if you're able to go to your screen, you'll see where there's a Q&A. You'll see a Q&A at the bottom of, it should be at the bottom right. It looks like this diagram here with the red around it. And at any point, starting now, you could put in any comments or questions that you have. You can put in multiple questions, uh, multiple comments. Uh, we encourage lots of feedback. And at the conclusion of the presentation portion, I will go immediately to that and I will read out the questions. So I will read the questions aloud so that the team members could hopefully provide some comments to you and perspectives. I will not read your name out when it's there. So there will be an, an opportunity to be anonymous, if you will. So I won't read your name, but I will read your question. I will probably scroll up and down. We, we do expect lots of input and we appreciate that. And uh, we try to our best to respond to all of the questions. Should we not be able to get to all of the questions this evening? We had planned the meeting to go to around eight o'clock. If we need to extend it, we will certainly do so. But from that perspective, we will be capturing them in the feedback report. So part of my role is also to put together a report on what has been stated in the question and answer and provide that to you and that's something that would be available on the website as well. We could keep going. Right. Other ways to provide your input, we just wanted to also make sure that you were aware that the city's website and you'll see it there mississauga.ca forward slash lakeshore 
dash transportation is where you will find right now the online open house materials. So between now, I think it was a week ago when it opened, and April the 8th, you could go on at any time, 24 hours 7, and scroll through materials, and there's a couple of key places for you to provide your comments on these three projects. Um, as I noted, the presentation portion of this uh, meeting will be posted on the website such that then others could review, could see it. And again, anytime you've got questions on this, these three projects, Gino De La Cruz is the person to send them to at mississauga.ca. And we'll make sure that his contact information is back up on our very last slide. So we go to the next slide, please. Great. So at this at this point, I'd like to call upon Councillor Dasco um, to provide some remarks to you about the projects and then to Gina Dela Cruz um, on behalf of the city. And then from there, we'll get into the specifics on the project. So, Councillor Dasco. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on what I think is just uh, in a, three very important uh, components for the Lakeshore Corridor. Um, so I, I, I don't want to get into any specifics, but really this is uh, information to be presented to everybody here. And also this is an opportunity to, uh, to, to be heard, uh, to, uh, to give us your thoughts, your questions, um, et cetera. So uh, what, I would, what I would really recommend is take this opportunity and, and as mentioned by Sue, uh, there is the, the website that uh, I encourage you to, to share with, uh, with others uh, as well uh, to make sure that we get uh, the most uh, feedback that we possibly can. Uh, my last that I would like to mention is, I, I don't know that I heard, did we do a land acknowledgement, Sue? Yes, we did. Okay, sorry. No, that was right uh, at the beginning, but that's I just it. wanted to make sure. Okay, I think I just no, missed thank that. you for that. All right, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, tonight's about you, so I'm going to turn it over to you right now, Sue. Thanks. Great. Do you know to you, please, for some, some comments on the studies? Yeah, thanks, Sue. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending our open house for our Lakeshore Transportation Studies. As Sue mentioned, if, if you were here for our first open house last fall, you would have seen me there. But again, I'm Gino Dela Cruz, the project leader at the city, uh, heading up this project. So I'm just going to make some high level comments and then I'll turn it over to Andrew and the team to provide updates and some details on the study. So uh, just to refresh everyone again, the Lakeshore Transportation Studies includes the three projects shown on the screen and they cover the entire length of Lakeshore within the city limits. So that's through Clarkson, Fort Credit and Lakeview communities. So, and the, these studies build upon the recommendations from the Lakeshore Connecting Communities uh, Transportation Master Plan that was uh, completed and endorsed by council in 2019. So we're building upon that. And uh, the three projects are separated out into the three uh, due to different uh, environmental assessment requirements and also different uh, implementation schedules. But they are, they're all being done under one assignment to ensure the end product is a cohesive one for the corridor. So just very briefly, uh, the first project there is the bus rapid transit study shown in green. It's a two kilometer stretch from East Avenue to the city of Toronto border. And that one is following an expedited environmental assessment process for transit projects. And uh, this round of consultation comes a few weeks after the official notice of commencement for the TPAP process. And then the next study uh, is what we're calling the complete street study. It's shown in yellow or orange there. It's uh, picking up from East Avenue, this time going westerly to the border uh, uh, with Oakville. And for this one, we are still early days in the EA process and uh, tonight we'll be presenting an alternative solution that's still consistent with the previous uh, master plan work. And then finally in pink there is the AT active transportation bridge study. Uh, it's the preferred credit river crossing uh, location that was identified in the master plan. And uh, the location is north of Lakeshore, just south of the existing uh, rail bridge. So tonight we'll be presenting our process in evaluating the alternative bridge designs and uh, some details of the preferred design. Uh, so this, this is our second open house. Uh, we have a lot of information to present tonight and we are looking to get your input and feedback on these projects. Uh, thank you again for everyone for attending. Uh, please review our project materials for more detail online. 
and uh, send your comments through uh, through the website or send me an email or give me a call. Uh, happy to hear everyone's thoughts and ideas on the on the three projects. And uh, as Sue mentioned, we did hear back. We have heard back already from many residents and business owners along the corridor. So we're happy folks are engaged and uh, we'll continue to have those discussions as we move forward. Uh, so I, I think that's it for me with that. And to get into the details of the studies, I'll turn it over to Andrew and the team uh, to continue with the presentation. Right. Just before we start with Andrew, uh, we've had a few people who've joined us in uh, while the presentation was started. So please avail yourself of the Q and A. Uh, this is a webinar, so you'll be able to put all of the comments and questions you like into that Q and A, and I will read them aloud when we come to our discussion. So you can um, certainly put them there, and they will be part of the record that we have for this evening. So Andrew, you are going to present the material on the Lakeshore Bus Rapid Transit Study. So we'll go to you first. Hey, thank you, Sue and, and Gino. Uh, well, just to get started, uh, if we can go on to the next slide here, uh, these, uh, this set of studies is really guided by the problem and opportunity statement from the Lakeshore Connecting Community Study, uh, which really had three, there are three key points to that. One, Lakeshore Road intersects a mix of established and developing communities. These are Clarkson, uh, Port Credit, Lakeview, et cetera. Uh, and preserving and enhancing the community's character and sense of place is important. Uh, there's a lot of change coming uh, to the study area in terms of development uh, and the demand that this will place on the transportation network really necessitates improvements uh, to the road and active transport network. Uh, and that being said, the corridor does include some very constrained areas with a lot of competing objectives for that limited road space. Uh, and with that limited road capacity in, in mind, there's a need to shift uh, away, uh, away from demand on, on automobiles to other modes. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, so we're, where we are in the process, as Gino mentioned, we've got 3, uh, 3 components to this project, uh, all following different timelines, uh, or different processes and on different timelines. Uh, part a, the bus rapid transit study is following this transit project assessment process. Uh, we're aiming to complete the uh, the consultation process and file the final report for this uh, uh, this uh, this this uh, TPAP uh, in the in the summer. Uh, part B is following a more traditional municipal class EA EA process, and this section uh, will present the results of the phase two analysis, looking at the alternative solutions. Uh, and following that, we'll progress the uh, preliminary design and impact assessment for the preferred alternative uh, to be presented at a subsequent uh, uh, PIC later in the year. Uh, part C, uh, also following a municipal class EA process, but this time a Schedule B uh, process. So something uh, a little bit scaled back from the, uh, uh, the Schedule C process of the complete streets component. Uh, again, uh, this. Uh, this session, we will present the results of the phase two analysis, the, uh, the alternative solutions assessment. And following that again, we'll finalize the, uh, the preliminary design and uh, impact assessment uh, and finalize the project file report. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so as as, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we held our first uh, public open house in September of 2021, and we, we did get some really good feedback from the community. Uh, and this slide presents a brief summary of some of the key themes uh, that we heard at the meeting that helped guide the work completed uh, since. Um, a few of the key comments we heard regarding the Part A uh, BRT study, uh, we certainly heard a desire to improve the cycling infrastructure in the corridor. Uh, general support for a, a center running uh, a BRT system or bus lanes, uh, but also some concerns over uh, potential uh, roadway congestion in the area and a desire to see some uh, traffic calming measures uh, to reduce speeding and, and traffic infiltration. Uh, on the complete streets study, uh, again, general support for alternative one, the, the mixed traffic option, and, and we'll speak speak to that a bit more uh, later on in this presentation. Uh, certainly, again, uh, an, a desire to improve the pedestrian and cycling 
safety uh, in the corridor and, and concerns over traffic congestion and road safety impacts. I think that's something that, uh, that that's present throughout the entire corridor. Uh, and uh, regarding the active transport bridge study, uh, again, just support for alternative for the signature bridge option. Uh, we'll we'll get into into that assessment in a bit more detail later on as well. Uh, we did hear a desire uh, for the integration of the bridge into the broader active transportation network. I think beyond the immediate vicinity of the structure, uh, and and uh, a strong desire to separate both the, the cyclist and pedestrian uh, portions of that bridge. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so now we're, we're gonna get into some of the details of the, uh, specifically of the BRT component of this. Um, this first slide uh, kind of speaks to the, um, again, the, the process and the schedule, which we've already touched on. So uh, just in the interest of time, we're gonna move on from there. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so the figure here illustrates the general cross section proposed for the roadway in the master plan study, and that formed really formed the basis for uh, for this design assignment. Um, and some of the key features uh, here we're proposing physically separated uh, bicycle lanes. Uh, these are these are uh, beyond a curb uh, beyond the curb of the the roadway. Uh, a widened roadway with two new uh, center running bus lanes. Uh, but maintaining two general traffic lanes per direction. Uh, in this case, uh, left turns and U turns would uh, uh, would be restricted to signalized intersections only. The, uh, we can't uh, can't have vehicles turning left uh, at unsignalized locations across that busway. Um, and we're also showing landscaped boulevards here. Uh, now I want to just provide the caveat, we're in the process of developing the landscaping plan uh, for this corridor. And as we as we get into the design uh, details, we're finding that there are a lot of utilities uh, in this corridor, subsurface utilities uh, that, are, that are posing a real problem uh, in terms of the placement of, of trees. Uh, we are working to fit in as many trees as possible in balancing the, uh, the utility impacts and, and potential utility relocations, uh, but uh, there, uh, the trees will not likely be uh, be achievable uh, throughout the entire corridor, but uh, but we are working to to fit as many as we can. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I just wanted to share a slide here il uh, illustrating the BRT stop design. This is a pretty key component. It's where passengers will interface with the system. Um, what's being proposed in this uh, in this uh, project is uh, stops similar to the, the Viva system uh, in York Region. For those familiar, that's what's illustrated here. Uh, the stops uh, that we're proposing will apply the same designs as the uh, the current Dundas BRT project to ensure consistency uh, among the two the two systems. Uh, now, this being a, a, a BRT system, a, a premium service, uh, there is uh, certainly. Uh, a desire to to provide a premium uh, set of passenger amenities on at these stops. Uh, they'll be fully accessible, uh, consistent with the uh, the requirements of the AODA uh, Act. Uh, we'll provide weather protection, seating, fare collection, uh, stop identification, and wayfinding signage, uh, and passenger information, uh, materials, service maps, next bus information. Uh, and of course, uh, garbage and recycling bins. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, over the next few slides, what we're going to show is a uh, just want to highlight some of the key features of the design itself, the role plan here. Uh, this uh, this plan is available in its entirety on the website, uh, but uh, we had to break it up into a few slides here simply to fit it in within this presentation uh, at a reasonable scale. So. Uh, this section we're looking at here uh, from Montbeck Crescent or West Avenue through to Lakefront Promenade. This is the western limit of the, the project. And you'll notice uh, on the approach to East Avenue, uh, you'll notice the right of way uh, widens considerably uh, beyond the existing roadway even. Uh, and that, that widened roadway really enables us to, uh, 
or widened right of way enables us to widen the roadway within the existing property uh, with very few property impacts. Uh, the um, what's shown in red here is the center uh, running busway. Uh, the notion is that buses would enter this from the uh, the, the the median uh, general purpose lanes uh, into this busway. Uh, and continue through uh, relatively unobstructed and, and separate from uh, from general traffic. Uh, so those BRT lanes will develop on the approach to East Avenue uh, and continue through uh, through as uh, as Gino mentioned, almost to Etobicoke Creek. Uh, a few of the key features we want to show here: uh, the dark blue in these plans represents the the curbside uh, cycle tracks. Uh, we have one per direction on on both the uh, so eastbound on the south side of the road, westbound on the north side. Uh, adjacent to a uh, what's shown in purple is an enhanced sidewalk, a 2.1 meter wide sidewalk, and we've highlighted in green opportunities for landscaping and streetscaping. Uh, again, this is where we're looking to uh, to fit street trees, uh, provided we can uh, we can manage the utilities in the in those areas. And at uh, on the right side of this figure uh, at that lakefront promenade, you'll see the first of our uh, BRT stops uh, in light blue. Uh, you'll see it's it's in the the center of the roadway, similar to a typical uh, uh, streetcar uh, type type facility, uh, with pedestrian access provided through the signalized uh, pedestrian crossing uh, at, associated with the intersection. Um, so if we could move on to the next the next piece, uh, the next section covers uh, from Lakefront Promenade through to Hydro Road, and uh, this is a bit of a unique section where we have three fairly closely spaced intersections. Um, the implication of that is that uh, in order to maintain uh, lane continuity and, and uh, you know, generally straight lanes through here uh, with the uh, uh, left turn lanes. Uh, we really do uh, it really does provide a wider uh, road or requires a wider road platform uh, and that uh, impose and introduces challenges to uh, to fitting in uh, any additional landscaping in this uh, particularly on the north side through here um, another uh, unique uh, unique element of this section uh, we're showing here a future extension of Ogden Avenue. Uh, that's not, uh, it's not proposed as part of this project, uh, but it is, uh, it, it, it is uh, indicated on, on the, um, uh, the redevelopment plans for the southern, uh, southern lands here. Uh, so we're protecting for that. The, the roadway has been designed to accommodate that in the future when it is implemented by, uh, by others, uh, but it is not a, a component of this project. If we can move on to the next uh, next slide here, the, the next section here from Hydro Road to Fergus Avenue. Um, on the left side of the plan here, you'll notice uh, some red hatching. That indicates uh, property that needs to be acquired uh, at this uh, hydro crossing, hydro corridor crossing. The right of way does uh, does pinch in uh, today, so so some additional property will have to be acquired to accommodate this widened roadway. I believe that land is owned by the region of Peel. Uh, it's not private, uh, privately owned property. Um, so that's our first, uh, our first instance of su uh, substantial property acquisition for this project. Um, at Hague Boulevard, the first uh, intersection uh, east of the Hydro Corridor, you'll notice uh, that's our second BRT stop. Uh, it's uh, it, it's the platforms here are illustrated. Uh, in opposing the uh, left turn lanes uh, on the other side of the road that provide that allows us to fit these platforms in with little uh, uh, little property impact. Uh, and continuing on to the uh, uh, to the east, uh, the next slide, if you can. Uh, this is our, the final section of the corridor uh, at Dixie Road. We have our third uh, our third stop. Uh, you'll notice on the south side here, we do have some additional property impacts. Uh, again, uh, slate right of way restriction at this at this area. 
uh, those property impacts on the south side are predominantly associated with the, the arsenal lands, the site of the small arms building. Uh, and that is a cultural heritage landscape. Uh, so we'll require a heritage impact assessment uh, to, to determine the significance of the impact and mitigation measures. Uh, beyond the Dixie Road stop, uh, the, the BRT sec the BRT in the center of the roadway drops and we transition back to the uh, typical uh, or existing roadway cross section in advance of Etobicoke Creek and the Etobicoke Creek structure. Uh, to, to which uh, and helps us uh, uh, hopefully uh, avoid any impacts to those uh, those elements. And if we can go, we have one more slide on this uh, this BRT section. Um, so uh, a thorough impact assessment has been undertaken and documented in a in a draft EPR that will be finalized and shared uh, for public review uh, towards the end of this TPAP process. Uh, this table here summarizes what we see are the kind of the key takeaways from the impact assessment, um, but the, the full details will be uh, will be presented in the, the draft EPR. Uh, in terms of, uh, I just want to hit on a few key points here. In terms of natural environment impacts, uh, we are impacting edge vegetation and street trees, uh, fish habitats and woodlots uh, at the watercourse crossings. Uh, we don't anticipate any permanent impacts to endangered species or species at risk. Uh, construction will be timed to uh, uh, dictate the uh, work occur out, outside of the breeding season. Um, and we will, uh, the city will be developing erosion and sediment control plans uh, to mitigate the impacts to the water course and a tree preservation plan uh, to, uh, to mitigate the impacts to the, uh, to the existing trees. Um, in terms of cultural heritage, uh, we do have to remove and reinstate a plaque uh, commemorating the Long Branch Aerodrome uh, that's at Hydro Road. And a heritage impact assessment, as I mentioned, will have to be undertaken uh, for the two cultural heritage landscapes that's uh, uh, at the Arsenal Lands and the adjacent 1300 Lakeshore Road East uh, property. Um, in terms of noise uh, and air quality impacts, uh, we don't anticipate any significant long-term impacts. We're not introducing any additional traffic uh, or not much uh, additional traffic as a result of this, but there will be uh, typical uh, construction related noise and air quality impacts. Uh, the, we can mitigate those uh, or minimize the impact of those through the use of best practices for construction, dust suppression measures, uh, requirements for vehicle maintenance, limits on hours of work, et cetera. Uh, in terms of road access, this is probably one of the more uh, uh, more sensitive issues associated with this project. Uh, the notion of the bus uh, busway down the center of the road, as I mentioned, requires that we restrict left turns uh, to signalized intersections only. Uh, the the uh, mitigation measure for that uh, is to uh, to provide sig uh, protected left turn phases and U-turn uh, U-turn phases at the signalized intersections. Um, and finally, in terms of property impacts, uh, we don't uh, require any full property takings uh, uh, for this project. Uh, we will have no minor localized property impacts uh, to accommodate the curbside bus stops, auxiliary lanes, uh, et cetera, and those will be coordinated through the city's property acquisition process. Okay, if we can move on. Andrew, thank you. Um, you might familiarize yourself. There are some questions already for you on the BRT, and I'll come to those as soon as we conclude the entire presentation. At this point, I'd like to call upon Angie Ning, who's going to present the information on the Lakeshore Complete Street Study, which we're referring to as the Part B study. Uh, so, Angie, if I could uh, have you come on, that would be helpful. Great, thanks, Sue. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, my name is Angie, and I'll be presenting the second project of the Lakeshore Studies, which is the Complete Street Study. Uh, and the objective here is to really create a multimodal corridor to improve the travel experience for all users, while aiming to preserve the, the character areas of the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. 
So we're now in phase two of planning where we are focusing on selecting the preferred transit solution and the general arrangement for the corridor, which looks at how space is allocated to driving, cycling, transit, and walking uh, between Godfrey's Lane and East Avenue. Next slide. So diving right in, uh, the first alternative is a mixed traffic scenario where buses would operate within um, general traffic. And, and here we see that we can have sidewalks that can be widened to 1.8 meters wide. Uh, we would have separated bike lanes that are 1.5 meters wide on both sides of the road uh, with buffer. Um, and we are also looking at a 2.4 meter wide landscaping area that alternates with lay-by parking. And in later phases of design, we would also look at uh, different ways to accommodate transit amenities like new bus shelters and bus pads where possible. Next slide. So alternative two is very similar to number one in that the sidewalks, uh, cycling and landscaping space are the same. Uh, the only difference here is that transit would be running in dedicated curb lanes. Uh, so that means uh, general purpose uh, traffic would be reduced to one lane in each direction. Next slide. Uh, alternative three is a dedicated center express service uh, where the two center lanes would be converted to transit only lanes, uh, leaving one lane in each direction for general traffic. Uh, so in this scenario, there would be uh, 60 meter long bus platforms at every express bus stop. Um, so in this case, you can have wider sidewalks, landscaping and cycling lanes at mid at uh, mid block, but it would be reduced or cut off at every express bus stop where the platform would be built at an intersection. Next slide. So alternative four is very similar to number one and two. So we would have wider sidewalks, landscaping areas, and cycling throughout. Uh, the main difference here is that the two Two of the bus lanes would be converted to high occupancy vehicle lanes or HOV in short, uh, which means that the lane would be reserved for buses or vehicles with several occupants. Uh, so that again, this would leave one lane in each direction for general purpose traffic. Next slide. So in the next phases of design, we'll be looking closely at where we can implement uh, transit priority measures like signal priority, turn restrictions, and queue jump lanes. Um, and each measure is going to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. So you'll see that uh, there would be some property impacts if we're looking at a queue jump lane, for example, which would require an extra 3.5 meters of right-of-way, um, and a new standard bus shelter uh, would require an additional 2.5 meters. Next slide. So similar to the evaluation criteria that Andrew had presented, uh, we will be using uh, the following criteria to evaluate the alternatives. So that includes mobility, quality of place and prosperity, the natural environment, public health and safety, and affordability. All right, next slide. So when we applied the evaluation framework against the alternatives, that gives us like kind of a big picture look uh, at how everything compares to one another. So from a mobility perspective, um, alternatives one and four uh, provide the best balance for walking, cycling, transit, and driving. Uh, from an environmental impact perspective, um, all of the alternatives are generally similar. Um, the environmental impacts and mitigation of the preferred alternative would be studied and documented in greater detail in later phases of the project. But if we look at the four in comparison, there isn't any uh, big differentiator between them. Uh, for public health and safety, again, all the alternatives are generally similar. Um, next slide. 
So for quality of place and prosperity, uh, alternatives one, two, and four perform similarly because we are we are providing uh, the same level of improvements for walking, cycling, and landscaping. Um, alternative three does stand out as a disbenefit, mainly because of the bus platforms. So you would have to reduce the overall landscaping area, sidewalk, and cycling path in order to accommodate those those long bus platforms. And from an affordability perspective, numbers one, two, and four are generally the same because uh, we're looking at uh, the same infrastructure. But however, number three does fare a bit worse since the infrastructure and property needed for a center running BRT with center platforms is much higher uh, is much higher in comparison. So at the very bottom of that table there, uh, based on the overall evaluation, alternative one is the most preferred because it provides the best balance across all criteria from a multimodal perspective without uh, much trade off with other project objectives. And with that, I'll pass it back to Sue. Great, thank you very much, Angie. At this point, then I'd like to call upon Nico Malfera, who's going to uh, provide information to you on the new Credit River Active Transportation Bridge Study. Nico. So next slide, please. So the next part of the presentation is about the uh, new Credit River Active Transportation Bridge uh, crossing. Uh, as my presenters before me noted, we're following a Schedule B class environmental assessment process for this new bridge. Um, and we're currently here at the second open house. Um, our next step is to select a preferred solution after hearing your input today. Uh, and then we'll finalize uh, our design and document that in a project file. Next slide. So we've uh, looked at four alternative bridge design solutions um, as part of the Schedule B Class EA. Uh, in addition, because of the EA process, we always look at a do nothing scenario, uh, and that is for comparison purposes. So the first alternative that we considered uh, is what we call conventional bridge. So this is, uh, a bridge that you see here in the picture, uh, it would have um, piers that could go into the water. Um, however, we screened this option out from further consideration in the study uh, through our engagement and consultation with the Conservation Authority. Um, we've been told that in-water piers are going to have a significant environmental impact, and so this is not a viable option. Therefore, we need to look at options that span the river uh, in a continuous fashion. Alternative two uh, was an idea to use or leverage the existing uh, go rail bridge that crosses here and potentially expand it to provide this crossing. Again, we screened out this option from further consideration as the bridge is not able to be, uh, it's not structurally able to expand the deck to meet the desired width that we would need for this crossing. Furthermore, through our discussions with our stakeholders, such as Metrolinx, uh, we are not able to uh, have a structure or addition to the structure within their right of way as they need to protect for their rail operations. So that leaves us with alternative three, which is what we call a truss bridge. So this will be carried for, for, further for um, evaluation and uh, alternative four, which is the signature bridge, which we are also carrying forward. Uh, next slide. So for the purposes of this evaluation, um, we are assuming that the truss bridge uh, could be a through truss bridge. So it's a type of bridge uh, that has a long history of being used for pedestrian and uh, vehicular and railway bridges. Um, they're an economical choice. Uh, they're typically prefabricated offsite and they can be uh, assembled on site in a relatively short amount of time and lifted into their final position. Um, there's not much um, opportunity for input into the design of these. They're, as I mentioned, prefabricated, so they basically come as they are. Whereas alternative four, uh, we're using a, are assuming a network tied arch bridge. Um, so this is a type of signature bridge. Um, it doesn't mean it's the only type. So there's other types of signature bridges that could be designed. The, the main point here is that these are custom design bridges. They can meet context specific requirements so, you know, the public has more opportunity to provide input into the design of them. Um, they can have strong aesthetic qualities to improve the, the area. Um, they're efficient and lightweight. 
uh, they tend to be more costly because of their uh, complex nature and custom design. Next slide. So both bridges will have the same uh, general transportation elements uh, on them, which will include separated cycling and pedestrian facilities, um, and they will be integrated with existing trails and cycling routes, and they'll be universally accessible. Next slide. So in terms of the layout of the bridge, uh, you can see here that uh, the path leading to the bridge will start at Mississauga Road, and connect all the way over the Credit River into the existing trail network within Port Credit Memorial Park. Um, we will have to shift Front Street slightly to the south to accommodate the new cycling and walking path on the north side. Um, we're currently working with our uh, property owners and stakeholders uh, to determine the exact configuration of the path between the bridge and Front Street. So you can see there in the blue shaded area that's still under development. Um, you can see the bridge there itself, uh, where it would lie. Uh, there will be impact to trees on either side of the river, and we have uh, will develop a restoration strategy for that. There's no uh, anticipated impact to the river uh, bed itself, um, which is a great thing. Next slide. So the bridge will have a 66 meter clear span, as you can see here, going right over the uh, the Credit River and connecting into both sides. Next slide. So similar to the other studies, we've evaluated uh, the alternatives using uh, multiple evaluation criteria framework with the same criteria um, Angie had mentioned previously. Next slide. So the uh, a summary of the evaluation for the bridges, uh, essentially they perform very similarly from a mobility quality of place and environment perspective. The key differentiator here is the visual impact. So that, as I had mentioned, the trust bridge doesn't really allow for public input and so uh, into the design. So um, an arch bridge or a signature bridge uh, supports our, our project outcomes uh, a little bit better in that regard. Next slide. And finally, for public health and safety, again, they uh, compare very similarly uh, in terms of affordability and complexity, again, as I mentioned, the signature bridge, uh, marginally more expensive depending on the design, uh, and again, is a little bit more complex in terms of its design and construction. So, in summary, uh, the do-nothing is our least preferred option, the trust bridge is our less preferred option, and our uh, most preferred option is the signature bridge. As I had mentioned, uh, this really supports the areas uh, overall active transportation goals and objectives. Um, it allows for greater aesthetic design that can reflect the community's context and can be you know, integrated into the overall environment. And last slide. So this summarizes our, our presentation for today. In terms of our next steps on the Lakeshore BRT study, as Andrew had mentioned, we're gonna finalize our preliminary design impact and mitigation and document that in our environmental project report, which will be put on public record for your comment and review. For the Lakeshore Complete Street Study, uh, we're gonna take all the input that we heard here uh, today and through the online website, and we'll use that to further develop our alternative design solutions, which will be presented at the next public open house. And on the Active Transportation Bridge Study, again, we're gonna use the feedback that we hear to finalize our preliminary design for the signature bridge and document that in our project file. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone for participating today. I see lots of questions, so we're gonna to get to those very, very soon. Um, again, if you have any other questions, you can email Gino, his email is here, or you can go on our website and continue to provide input there.